All right, we are in Psalm 119, and uh, we're dealing with the next section, and this is the Hebrew letter Main, and uh, we're beginning in verse 97. So we're, we're getting through uh, Psalm 119, we're on verse 97, and we'll take uh, this section all the way through verse 104 tonight. Psalm 119 and verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep your precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way, that I may keep your word. I have not departed from your judgments, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. I don't know about you, but when I read that, it's hard. <laughs> I mean, you've made me wiser than my enemies. I have more understanding than all my teachers. I understand more than the ancients. That is, uh, that's hard. I mean, if one, of, if one of you came up and said that to me, and I hadn't been studying this psalm, I'd look at you kind of funny. If I said that to you, you'd look at me kind of funny. Who do you think you are? Um, it sounds arrogant, doesn't it? It sounds like uh, someone is boasting. But we have to read the whole thing in its context, right? He has room to boast because it is God's word that makes all the difference. But there is an anchor of the arrogant, right? This is people who uh, put their trust in man instead of putting their trust in the Lord or in their own abilities to figure life out. For example, take the Pharisee in Luke chapter 18 and verse 11. I love that example because it says that the Pharisee stood and he prayed with himself. <laughs> he didn't pray to God. The Bible says he prayed with himself. And he prayed God, but he was talking to himself because God wasn't hearing him. I thank you that I am not like other men. This is, sounds pretty arrogant too. Extortioners they are, you know, unjust, adulterers. Or even as this tax collector. Jesus said that that man wasn't heard and he didn't go away right with God. But the tax collector did because he prayed to God in all humility and he was justified. Um, this guy prayed with himself. Jesus explained why that was so in Luke 18 and verse 14. He said, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. See, the Pharisee was religious, he was knowledgeable, but he was really, really arrogant. We find a prayer like that offensive, and rightly so. We, we know that it's offensive. We can hear it in its tone. That's how it should be. The problem is, what I fear most about what the Pharisee prayed is that I would do the same thing and be in his shoes. That I would just be praying with myself tonight instead of praying before God. The Bible says, do not be wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. Don't be wise in your own eyes, it says. Proverbs 3 and verse 7. The Bible says that we should be of the same mind with one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Romans 12 and verse 16. And then God pronounced woe upon those who are wise in their own eyes in Isaiah 5 and verse 21. It's right next to the part where he pronounced woe on the drunkard and the people who take advantage of alcohol. They're the only two things in that particular section that he pronounces woe upon. So he finds pride to be awfully offensive. So here in Psalm 119, it's interesting as we consider what the psalmist is saying, and its connection to our knowledge and our understanding of God's word. Because the psalmist thinks about the word of God all day. 
We like to think that we think about the Word of God all day, but I mean, he really did. He set his mind to think about God's Word and to meditate upon it. I guess if we were doing that, if we were thinking about God's Word all day and we were applying it to our lives, then we could say what he said, that the Lord's commandments make us wiser than our enemies. They don't, they don't have the wisdom from God. We do. His understanding is more than all of his teachers, and... His understanding is more than the ancients. There's no way around this idea of boasting, but he's boasting because he's getting all of this, the source of his wisdom from God and from God alone. That's the key difference in everything. It's the idea of crediting God for the wisdom that we have. This is what Paul did so well in 1 Corinthians, uh, what he did throughout his epistles. Um, we, we have to think of our lives and realize that we've got the world that's around us. It's got energy in it. And the energy within the world, this is something that Satan does, is constantly trying to distract us from what is truly important. And what is truly important each day is that we meet with God and his word. And that we, we spend time there and that we're absorbing the principles, the precepts, the commandments that God has laid down for us. That's the one thing that's needful in life, but it's the one thing that we often just kind of shove to the periphery of our lives. And Satan loves it when we do that. I mean, think about all the people that we work with and the people that we're around. So many brilliant people. You know them. I know them. Really, really smart people. Really, really sharp people. Even personable. They even have um, an inoffensive way about them, a, a charisma, uh, something that makes you like them something that isn't off-putting, that isn't arrogant. And yet they don't, they don't know God. They seem so smart, so talented, but they can't see God. But then take a man like the tax collector who is miserable and realizing that he's coming to the end of himself, or take people that are struggling to read in our world today, are struggling to put two thoughts together, really can't think in a logical way. Um, those people may fear the Lord, and the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the Hebrew word there is the principal part of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the principal part of wisdom. That means it's 51%. So they're more than halfway there just by fearing God, understanding that he is there and responding to life with that in mind. And so they depend on him. They depend on him to make their decisions and they have the wisdom that they need. They are cultivating the idea that God is here. And I better, I better watch my P's and Q's. I better respond to him in a way that will please him. They're not figuring out how much they can get by with. They are saying to themselves, God is here. I fear him. I'm going to respond in the light of that. That's what they're saying. And God blesses that kind of thing. They have a good understanding of life. They confound people that are smarter than they are. But God, he, he doesn't hear those who are foolish and arrogant. They're likened to brute beasts in the word of God. But we have an anchor, an anchor of the word, and that's what makes us wise. So that's the anchor of the arrogant, but then we've got the anchor of the wise. You know, in our academy, each and every day, we start off the day with a pledge to the Bible in our chapel time. Pledge to the American flag a pledge to the Christian flag. No students kneeling yet. Hopefully that won't happen. But we pledge allegiance to the Bible. And when we do that, um, we say, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It's a good reminder each and every day. And that's the way it is with the anchor of the wise. We, we know that this is true in God's word, that he is going to show us the way. That he's going to provide for us not only guidance, but as we're going through the day, the answers to problems that we face. If I fail to study God's word, though, think of that verse. Then God's word is not a lamp to my feet. It is not a light to my path. And when I don't have that light, when I don't have that lamp, I have nothing that would keep me from stumbling, nothing that would keep me from making the wrong decisions and the wrong choices and get me off on bypass metal in my life so that I'm in the slough of the despond for a little while until I finally come out of it. Because God is merciful when I cry out to him. If, 
if I am wiser than my friends, if I am wiser than my foes, if, as he says here, I have more understanding than all my teachers, if it's true that I know more than all the ancients, uh, and those are three very big ifs in my case, and I, I expect that you would think that way too. But if that were true, it's only because we have a love for God's word and we meditate on it all day. It is something that we are geared toward. It's something that we think of often and it keeps us from derailing in our lives. And so, as I was saying to the kids today, I have God's word in my heart. It's constantly directing me. So, since I believe God's word, since I believe what it says, I'm going to depend on the precepts of God's word and I'm going to obey him. But if that idea of faith and belief doesn't preface obedience, then it's not really obedience at all. No matter what it looks like, it's not obedience. There's a problem. It's just me doing what I think is right instead of doing what I know is right because God has revealed it to me. And, and it's the same with the kids. When we're teaching the kids, we want them to make decisions on the basis of God's word and not on the basis of what we're telling them or even with my boys. It's not because I tell them that it's so in our dinner devotions. It, it, is, it is them interacting with God's word and making the decisions because they know that God is near and that he demands this of them and expects this of them. And so we're always pointing them to the word of God. We learn about the liberty that we have from the word of God. That's where we learn about it. And that's where we trust. And I, I would never believe that this was true. None of these things that I've been saying outside of the word of God. They seem so simple to us now, but they are, they are sophisticated things. They're the whole, they, all of these things are the things that we run our lives by. For example, if I abide in Christ and Christ abides in me, if I'm in Christ, I know that I have the wisdom that I need. All right? But, but if I'm outside of Christ, if I'm not abiding in Christ, then I despise everything that he wants me to be. Actually, I despise him. And that's the truth. And so they may have that superior intellect in the world and really caught fire today when I was... It doesn't matter how nice... I'm just going to say this, but it doesn't matter how nice Ken Ham is. <laughs> he is absolutely just killed on the internet it just drives me crazy i can't even read the comments whenever he tweets something on uh, twitter it drives me nuts because here here's a man that people are scoffing at but what's the main reason they're scoffing is because he fears god and what's happening to him is just kind of a microcosm of what's happening to all of christianity in our world today as we're being set aside and being scoffed at for what we believe in the scriptures. And so we have this decision that we're going to make, right? This choice that we're going to have every day. Are, are we going to bow to the scoffers and give in to them? Or are we going to stand on what we know is true? Because we value our relationship with Christ more than we value our relationship with scoffers. They, they may have the superior intellect. They could wipe the floor with me in a debate. They could... They're, they're superior in, as far as their resources are concerned. All of those things may be true, but they don't have wisdom. See, that's the key. I know that they don't have wisdom because Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 9 says they have rejected the word of the Lord. If they have rejected the word of the Lord, he asks this rhetorical question, what wisdom do they have? And the answer is they have none. They have no wisdom. They don't have an anchor. They're adrift. That's why I've watched people in my family that are unsaved. And they, were, they, they had this sense of morality about them. And they were fixed on these opinions about abortion and homosexuality. And all of these things that, that were verboten in, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And then I just watch them through the years as they grow older morph and adopt the positions that we see today. The positions that are espoused from their, by their favorite um, news network or whatever it happens to be. They change, they shift. They had no anchor back here. They had nothing it, it, because it wasn't wisdom. It wasn't based in the word of God. It was based really on what everyone else was doing. And so as they move forward here, 
they start to think to themselves, well, maybe it isn't unreasonable if it's a loving relationship between two women or two men. And so they believe the lie of the world that's energized by the devil. They, they never believe what God had said or revealed about it. It was just their own thoughts, their own pop, the own pop opinion that was out there. And because they don't have an anchor, they don't have wisdom. It's, it's a terrible thing. But we have an anchor, steadfast and sure. We are, we are either moving backwards or forwards in the Christian life. I've said this for years. We, there's, no mutual, there's no neutral gear for Christianity. You can't, wouldn't it be great if we could learn what we need to learn and we could just park for a little while and rest? And It doesn't work that way. You just keep moving forward. If you don't, then you get knocked backwards. And that's the problem. It's a constant fight. And so we don't get the idea that we just stay in one place. No, we, we are anchored in God's word, but we're constantly fighting the world around us. And so the temptation for us is to, well, I'm in God's word. I'm amassing all of this knowledge. And, and now what happens is we begin to congratulate ourselves and we start to boast in what we know. But the problem is it's not what we know, right? That's not the issue. It, it's not what you know. It, it's what you know and then what you believe and then what you act upon when you go out in life. So I know a lot of people who know a whole lot about the Bible, but they don't put any of it into practice. So the knowledge has to be put into practice in order for it to have any effect and certainly for it to glorify God in our lives. That's why... The, the strongest believers have incredible wisdom and at the same time they sense their humility before people and before God and they act accordingly. That's why Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners and the least of all saints and he believed that about himself because he understood who God was. And whenever Paul boasted, he didn't boast in anything except for his weaknesses because then the power and the strength of God could be seen through his life. That's what 2 Corinthians 12 is all about. And I think we need to take the cue that he's given to us and, and listen to our Lord Jesus when he said, hey, when you go into a feast, go and take the lowest seat in the house. And you'll be glad you did when the master of the feast comes to you and says, hey, friend, no, move up. You shouldn't be sitting in the lowest seat. Allow God to exalt you. That was the point of that little story. Rather than you walking in there with your assertive abilities and your charisma and putting yourself in the chief seat. And then you get knocked down a few pegs and humiliated before people. Esteem others better than yourself, Jesus said. Paul wrote, For not he who commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 18, the, the finishing of that ellipsis is, the Lord commends him and therefore he's approved. That's the idea. We either love God's word or we despise it. There's no in between in that scenario either. People say, no, I don't despise God's word and yet they don't pick it up throughout the whole week. You know, if we claim that we really love God's word and we neglect it in our private life, then in fact we despise it. That's what it's all about. I mean, we can't deny that. If we're never in the Word of God and we just kind of touch base with it whenever we're together, that's a big problem. There's something wrong. We don't really have a relationship with God. And we're, we're not experiencing what the Bible says when it says that, oh, God's Word is more important than even my daily food. It's sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. Or, oh, how I love, he says here, your law. It is my meditation all the day. So the idea is it's not enough to read God's word. We feed on it. We're constantly taking in scripture so that we live a life that pleases God. That's true Christian character. Anything else is really empty and vain in life. So God completes and sanctifies us through his word. Your word is truth, he says in John chapter 17. That, that's important because I think about that. God doesn't complete me or sanctify me on the basis of my good works right apart from his word those works mean nothing but if if everything i do is generated from my relationship with him and his word then he's going to help me to grow 
and to make my reflector, like we were talking about on Sunday, a little bit bigger so that I can glorify God in my life. The scriptures alone make me wise through faith. Wise not just for salvation, but wise for the rest that I need in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, how I love your law, he says. It is my meditation all the day. So we are anchored in the word of God. Let's pray together.